reaching epidemic levels and it's costing us billions of pounds every year. Oh. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injury claims, even facts and facts. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing. And every year, it's adding up to £50 to your insurance bill. Insurers are fighting back, armed with covert surveillance systems. It's a subject out the vehicle. Sophisticated data analysis techniques. And highly skilled dedicated police units. Police, don't move, stay where you are! They're catching the criminals red-handed. All those con men, scammers and cheats on the fiddle, now they're caught in the act and claimed and shamed. insurance fraud team, IFED, is hunting down suspects. There is a problem because he was running out the back door, so don't say there's no problem. Surveillance footage is used to quash a hugely exaggerated compensation claim. Eureka, it's a really good moment to actually catch this woman doing what she was doing. And a higher car smash goes viral. Good for YouTube, not very good for us, not very good for business, and certainly not good for him. With ever-increasing amounts of traffic on the roads, minor accidents are unavoidable. A busy town in Essex was the scene of one such incident involving a bus. Five months later, the bus company heard from Emma Piper, one of the passengers who'd been on board. She claimed that she'd been injured as a result. Lee Ingram from First Group's Transportation Claims Division worked on the case. Ms Piper alleges that on the 27th of June 2003, a bus had overshot the turning and was reversing back when it clipped the curb and a sign. She was alleging that she was sat at the back of the bus with her child on her lap and she subsequently injured her back. The team started an investigation. They began by talking to the driver, but immediately drew a blank when they asked him what had happened. On this particular occasion, he had no recollection. It seemed as if the original accident had been minor. We therefore made quite a low offer to her. But she rejected the offer and went on to claim that she was suffering from a long list of health issues including back problems and walking difficulties. She was claiming the higher level of disability living allowance, which would suggest that she would have a severe walking difficulty. In some circumstances, she could not walk at all. She's also claiming that she was unable to lift her child. The claimant states that following this accident, all of her hobbies ceased. Uh, now, one of her hobbies was actually roller skating. She carried on to claim that she was unfit for any type of work and would not be able to work again in the future. The severity of the alleged injuries meant the amount she was claiming for was enormous. The claim submitted was round about the half million mark in total. Lee and his team decided to place Emma Piper under surveillance. What they found was a revelation and totally contradicted her claims. The the most obvious thing that jumps out is her removing things from the rear of the car, which at one stage included her holding a handbag, which seems to be quite a hefty handbag at arm's length, and also managing to haul out of the back of the car a car battery. One of her main complaints is that she couldn't lift and carry her children. She is clearly seen to be doing this. She also alleged that she had walking difficulties and back pain, but is seen walking freely and carrying heavy items. She's also seen driving on many occasions, something she claimed caused discomfort. When we saw this, the actual extent of the things that she was doing just made us think, Eureka, it's a really good moment to actually catch this woman doing what she was doing. And her claim to have been forced to give up the hobby she loved also appeared to be in dispute. We made some checks with the club of which she was a member for roller skating and spoke to the manager of the roller rink, who kindly provided us with records of her subsequent attendance and there were also incidents where she had reported injuries to them after she had been skating. During a speed skating session she had managed to skate into the end wall and winded herself. Despite the overwhelming evidence, Piper insisted on pursuing her huge claim and both sides ended up in court more than once. We actually had 26 court hearings three appeals and three trials. It was impossible to argue with the surveillance evidence, and the final result was unsurprising. The judge found Ms Piper to be wholly unreliable. The judge found that there may have been an incident, but if there was, 
it had only caused a very short period of injury to the claimant. Subsequently, he made an award of just under £1,050. Uh, that is something like 0.2% of the original claim that was submitted. But the story didn't end there for Piper. In the event that a reasonable offer is made and uh, then rejected, when the judge finally makes his decision, he is going to award costs in your favour. And that is exactly what's happened in this case. She subsequently has to foot the bill for the legal costs. The cost will run into tens of thousands of pounds, and we do intend to fully pursue Miss Piper for that money. Emma Piper's greed ultimately led to her downfall. And instead of walking away with compensation, she's now left with a huge bill. This is a great result for First Group in that we managed to successfully defend what could potentially have been a very large claim. One of the UK's biggest insurance fraud rings is busted. That would have represented a financial loss to the industry of about six and a half million pounds. And a driver is left with a hefty bill after taking a hire car for a spin on a racetrack. He wouldn't have taken his own car for this race day, so why on earth is he taking our car? Combating the ever-increasing threat of insurance fraud is an elite police squad known as IFED, the Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department. IFED is a 35-strong unit that works tirelessly to hunt down and prosecute insurance fraudsters wherever they may be throughout England and Wales. They've made over 300 arrests and have saved millions of pounds in fraudulent insurance claims, money which ultimately goes back in our pockets. From now on, fraudsters need to watch their backs. Since the formation of IFED in January 2012, the goalposts have moved, and now if you commit insurance fraud, there's every chance you may get a knock on your front door. Head of IFED, DCI David Wood, and DC Tom Hill are working on a case of insurance fraud involving online motor insurance policies. The investigation has reached the stage where they're ready to make arrests and collect hard evidence of suspected criminal activity. We're going to execute a search warrant for a um, insurance fraud. The suspects are believed to be what's known as ghost brokers, a term for when fraudsters falsify details, such as ages and addresses, to get the cheapest possible insurance deal, and then sell it on to third parties at a substantial profit. Innocent policyholders scammed by the ghost brokers often have no idea their insurance isn't worth the paper it's written on. The next step in the investigation is to gather evidence to strengthen their case. So the IFED team is about to pay the suspects an early morning visit. So we've got a search warrant to search and we'll seize computer equipment and mobile phones that um, we believe we used to take out the policies. What we don't know is what's going to be behind the door. We can do a certain amount of checks, uh, research and intelligence. Uh, however, you never actually know um, until you go through the door, so you've got to be on your toes. The IFED team needs to find the three main suspects and also potential evidence in the form of computer equipment that links them to the suspected scam. The IFED team, together with support from the local police force, has arrived outside the house where they believe the three suspects live. So what we're doing now is we're all getting in position. Uh, we've got officers covering the back should anyone try and get away or any evidence get discarded from the back of the property. And then once we're ready, we'll start knocking on the door. Yeah, let's do it, let's. Morning. 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 After a delay, they're let into the house and have to move quickly to lock down the building and identify the suspects they want to arrest. Who's in here? The occupants are less than happy to see my friend. The IFED team takes the man and woman into the front room to arrest them, but so far there's no sign of the third suspect. Okay, let me explain. We've got a search warrant for the address. It relates to insurance fraud. Sorry? Do you speak English? Yes, you need to. So what will happen is you'll come to the police station and we'll interview you about the offence. Okay, no problem. Yeah. There's a problem when the suspects start speaking to each other in another language. Just stop a minute. Do you mind just speaking in English? 
Just speak in English, okay? Otherwise, we'll just take one okay, of you okay. to the car and we'll... That, that's all right. What were you saying? Just speak in English, No, okay? for coming to my daughter, for looking at my children. Tom needs to ensure that they're not exchanging English information that could okay. affect his case. The delay in gaining access to the property has made the team suspicious, and they immediately check out the backyard. We're a little bit concerned that um, it took them some time to open the door. Um, we have got a power of entry, but we don't like to smash people's doors there unless we really have to. Um, we're looking for electronic devices that this fraud has been perpetrated on. So we're talking computers, laptops, smartphones perhaps. Um, and we don't know whether he had a sufficient time to come out into the yard and secrete a, maybe a telephone perhaps. What do you think? The search continues inside, and it's not long before they find the computer equipment they're looking for, but in an unexpected place. Not a common place to put in, keep laptops in your bathroom, is it? So, mate, listen, make a decision where you're going to be, because you're up and down and all over the place. You can't, you can't, yeah, just don't want you jumping up and running off. Just come you can't be going up and down the stairs. No, 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 it's clear by now that the third suspect isn't in the house, so they concentrate on going through the paperwork. And it's not long before DCI David Wood turns up something significant. Yeah, what we've got here is a bank statement for the lady um, who's just been arrested. And this is very good for us because it's showing the actual card payments going from her bank account to the insurance company. For example, on one day, there are five separate payments to the one insurance company, each going out for sums between 40, 50, 60 pounds. That is highly unusual. There's money coming into the account, which we would suspect to be from people that are buying the bogus policies from these suspects. And a further examination of the bank account shows money's going back to their homeland if there's a transfer there of uh, 12,000 pounds. Yeah, that's quite a busy, uh, busy bank account she's got there. Um, Excuse me, we've, we noticed uh, by the baby there's a phone, a mobile phone, um, j just underneath the blank, that's it, we need that. Uh, no, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Carmen, if you just give that to me. Okay. Thank you. Who's is that? Is your phone? No, my daughter. Your daughter's phone? Yes. We're happy though, Tom, with the um, seeing yeah. the bank, bank statements, isn't it? Yeah, and there's... Oh, there's yeah. computers. Over ten. Over ten so far. Obviously, there's a lot of phones that can be used to access the internet as well, so we seized a few phones. Okay. Downstairs, a key piece of suspected evidence has been recovered from its hiding place. As the iPad team goes through what they've found, the two suspects are taken to a local police station for further questioning. The material they've collected looks promising, but they're still missing a vital part of the puzzle, and perhaps the key to the whole case, the third suspect. There is a problem because he was running out the back door, so don't see there's no problem. The Audi RS4 is a top of the range sports car. It's typical of the sort of prestige vehicle that is stocked by Accidents Exchange. They provide temporary replacement vehicles for policyholders. Neil Thomas is Director of Investigative Services. If somebody's involved in a non fault accident, they are entitled in law to a replacement like for like car. And that's where Accidents Exchange comes in supplying the vehicles in question. In what seemed like a straightforward case, the company had provided a vehicle to a driver who'd suffered a non-fault accident and was waiting for his own car to be fixed. And this particular car was an Audi RS4 estate car, which is uh, a sports car, uh, valued probably about 40, 50,000 pounds at the time. So far, so routine. But it wasn't long before Accident Exchange received a phone call from the driver, who informed them that he needed a replacement car for his replacement car. Against the odds, he'd had another serious accident. The client said that he was driving in a country lane, lost control of the car, and collided with a ditch at the side of the road. Accident exchange recovered the vehicle so they could assess the damage. Yeah, it was scrap value, really, which on a car like that is a very expensive commodity to repair. So the damage was sufficient that it was written off by the insurance company. But something about the driver's version of events didn't add up. We've got a fleet of 3,000 vehicles, so we investigate all collisions, certainly where the cars are written off. Um, and our suspicions were aroused because of the level of the damage. It was also significant that the driver said the accident had happened on a quiet country lane with no witnesses. There was no proof either way. There's no CCTV. There's nothing to negate 
or prove actually what the collision, had, uh, how the collision had occurred. It was clear that the case needed further investigation. In common with most top-of-the-range vehicles, the Audi RS4 is fitted with a raft of sophisticated security features, including a tracking system. We examined the technology within the vehicle, which indicated that, uh, firstly, the accident hadn't happened how he said, and secondly, it wasn't in the location he said it was. The driver claimed that he crashed the car on a B-road in Castle Coombe, Wiltshire. The tracker showed that he was in Castle Coombe, but not on a B-road. The intelligence we got from the car and the investigation showed that this guy had actually taken the car to a racetrack for a race day. It was the breakthrough the investigation needed. And if the driver hadn't had such a top-of-the-range car, he might never have been caught out. The tracker showed he'd lied about the location and the crash had actually happened on a racetrack during an open day. Rodney Gooch works at Castle Coombe Circuit. Castle Coombe Circuit, established in 1950 on the site of an old wartime airbase, uh, been racing ever since, uh, seen most of the big names in British motor racing. It's a very demanding track. I mean, it's 1.85 miles around. It has some very, very challenging corners. My advice to you, as always, when you start off, take it steady. But more evidence was to come in the form of a video clip of the race day that appeared online. The clip shows the shocking moment when the driver of the silver Audi estate loses control. When we checked this YouTube video, we could obviously see it was our car. So we got video evidence showing that the collision hadn't happened how the client told us. It had happened going around the racetrack and the way he was driving, for me, it wasn't a surprise they had the collision. In addition, there were plenty of witnesses who'd seen the crash. Bob Honeyset works on the Castle Coombe recovery team. The car came around Camp Corner, started drifting out. I remember it quite clearly because I thought he held it, and then the car snapped back. And as he snapped back, he uh, went straight into the tire wall. The session was stopped as we were loading the car onto the flatbed truck. The driver was out there and he was ripping the number plates off the car. And I was asking him, I was like, oh, why, why are you doing that? And he said, oh, I don't want anybody to know who it belongs to. We were quite, quite suspicious then. It was quite a spectacular crash. Good for YouTube, not very good for us, not very good for business, and certainly not good for him. The truth behind the crash had finally come out. But one thing was still unclear, why the driver had lied to accident exchange in the first place. The answer lay in the terms of his insurance cover, which didn't include driving on racetracks. He knew he wasn't insured. He wouldn't have taken his own car for this race day, so why on earth is he taking our car? With a wealth of evidence stacked against the driver, accident exchange decided to act. He denied it first of all, but then when we said we got a YouTube video, he actually accepted that he had taken us to race track day, uh, he had written it off, and he subsequently paid us for the damage to the car. With no insurance cover, he had to pay the entire amount out of his own pocket, a sum of £25,000. I think with some of the cars, people think it's a hire car so they can take it to a race track, they don't have to look after it. We've got a different view in racing to that because obviously it's a very nice car and we expect clients to look after them as they would their own car. The Insurance Fraud Bureau, the IFB, is a body set up by the insurance industry to combat insurance fraud. In 2007, they began an investigation which ended up revealing one of the biggest motor insurance frauds ever in the UK, involving a whopping six and a half million pounds. But it all began with a small-scale investigation into similar claims linked to the same accident management company, Real Accident Helpline. Ben Fletcher is head of the IFB. It was run by two people. The director was Nash Bandy and the company secretary was Hilleman. Accident management companies operate by processing insurance claims on behalf of drivers. The majority are genuine, but an increasing number are used by criminals as a front for fraudulent activities. The IFB examined the evidence that had been forwarded to them. With Real Accident Helpline, there were um, a number of similarities with the claims which started to cause concern. There were some collisions that had been alleged to have happened where they didn't. The policies were taken out using identities, which when we started to do investigation work, the people behind those policies 
didn't exist. A lot of the people that were on the books of Real Accident Helpline were ghosts. By now, it was clear that Real Accident Helpline was linked to fraudulent activity. The IFB contacted the Metropolitan Police. DC Tony Reckier led the case. My initial thoughts were that this would be quite a quick investigation. However, it wasn't long before we realised that there was a lot more to this. What set alarm bells ringing was the sheer number of claims being put through and how similar they were. Most of their collisions were rear end shunts because they realised that these are very rarely going to be contested by the insurance companies. The investigation moved on to the two men behind Real Accident Helpline. We quickly found out um, that they were using overseas travel. Um, we found various photographs, um, documents linking them to exotic cars. They were always immaculately dressed, wearing designer clothes, so they were living quite a good lifestyle. Um, overtly. But living the high life isn't cheap, and Nash Bandy and Hilleman made the mistake of processing so many claims they weren't able to cover their tracks. To save time, they started repeating names, details and locations. Most of these um, companies, they get a bit blasé and a bit greedy, and, and that opens a few more doors. One such door revealed a key piece of evidence that allowed the police investigation to move to the next level. The Asset Protection Unit at Credit Hire Company Accident Exchange was yet again on the case. They were conducting a separate investigation into a credit hire claim also linked to Nash Bandy. Our suspicions were that he was going to use our car as part of the staged accident. A staged accident is an accident that has been deliberately caused in order to create a fraudulent and inflated insurance claim. The company took steps to recover the car in what's known as a snatchback procedure. Part of the procedure is that we take the car back and bring it back to Accident Exchange headquarters uh, and it's searched by my staff under video conditions. When we searched the car, we found some documentation in it. So there were things like claim forms, there were things like sketches of accidents. It was obvious to us that the paperwork related to the arrangement or the execution of a staged accident. Accident Exchange immediately shared their information with the police, who linked it to their existing real accident helpline investigation. It was the first solid piece of evidence that we had obtained. The rest of it was just claim forms from insurance companies. It was a eureka moment, dare I say, um, because it, it definitely linked these people and opened the door to, to their um, corrupt um, dealings with, with members of the public. Tony and his team moved quickly to shut the fraud down by obtaining search warrants to raid the homes of Nash Bandy and Hilleman. Inside of these home addresses, we found a large amount of cash. It was about £60,000 that, that we found, um, but it was in various bundles. People would hide money in their houses because they either don't trust the banks, which is very, very rare, or it's because it's ill-gotten gains. They also raided the offices of Real Accident Helpline and found evidence of fraud in the shape of multiple claim forms. The police realised that Nash Bandy and Hilleman were processing fraudulent claims on an industrial scale. Real Accident Helpline dealt with in the region of 250 accidents and up to 1,000 people. That affected about 20 insurers and had those claims been paid, that would have represented a financial loss to the industry of about six and a half million pounds. It was one of the biggest motor insurance frauds ever uncovered in the UK. Ultimately, it was the greed and the arrogance of Nash Bandy and Hilleman that was their downfall. Despite the overwhelming evidence against them, the two men initially pleaded not guilty when the case reached court. But Hilleman subsequently admitted his guilt. Massey Nash Bandy, on the other hand, maintained his innocence. Um, it, the case went to trial at Croydon Crown Court at the end of a five-week trial, and due to the sheer weight of evidence against him, um, a jury found him guilty of conspiracy to defraud. Massey Nash Bandy was given seven years, three months, which I believe um, is still the longest sentence for a crash for cash kind of fraud. Um, and Saboon Hilleman was given four years, 10 months. It seems somewhat ironic that they actually chose to call their business Real Accident Helpline, given the vast majority of the 250 claims were actually for people that didn't exist and accidents that never happened. IFED, the City of London Police's Insurance Fraud Enforcement Department, has raided an address in connection with a suspected motor insurance fraud case. They tracked down two suspects to a house and found potential evidence hidden in a bathroom and a baby's cot. 
but they're still on the hunt for the third suspect. It's vital that he's apprehended as quickly as possible in case he tries to get rid of evidence or cover his tracks. We're satisfied with what we've uh, seized at this address and we've got the two main suspects. However, there is a third suspect who lives uh, in the same street um, and we do need to speak to him. So now we're going to go down and give him a knock and see what he's got to say. Good morning, open up. It's police. Hello, good morning. Sorry to disturb you, sir. I'm DC Eisman from City Police. Um, we're looking to try and find whether a male lives here. Uh, have, you, have you seen this, this man before? No, OK. That address was of interest because the address has been used as part of the scam. But unfortunately for those people that are living there, and they've been there over a year, um, they're not part of it. So it's just a bit unfortunate for them. We've had to knock them up early. But that address does feature in the inquiry but they haven't committed any offences, therefore we've taken it no further at this stage. It turned out that the suspects in the first house had previously lived in the second house, which is why suspicious activity had been linked to that address. It's vital that IFED arrest the third suspect as quickly as possible to prevent them destroying evidence or skipping town. They hit the road to follow up a lead on a third address. This is a address that has come up on a recent bit of intelligence that we've worked on. Same surname as the other people who have been arrested. As soon as the door is opened, the IFAG team spots someone they recognise. Oh, you just come from the other address. A boy from the first house who said he was leaving to go to school has instead turned up here, suggesting that the occupants of both houses are linked. Can I come in and I'll explain to you? Why were you running out the back door? Ask him why he was running out the back door. All three of you. There is a problem yeah. because he was running out the back door, so don't say there's no problem. If there was no problem, people don't run out the back door and the police knock at the front door. The inhabitants deny any knowledge of the third suspect. They're asked to supply ID, which the IFED team cross-checks with a printout of the man's details. It looks like IFED has its man. Just come over a minute. I'll explain what's going to happen. I'm from the City of London Police. Yes. Okay, and we're investigating an uh, insurance fraud. You all heard? A fraud. Yeah. Yeah, for motor car oh, insurance. Car you, insurance. You've got an inquiry. Yes. Okay. Right. I'm arresting you on suspicion of fraud by false representation. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to say anything, but I'm out of your defence if you don't mention my question. So I'm going to let around the court. Yeah. We do this, please. Yeah. Overall, it's been a successful operation this morning. We found several items of evidence that will be crucial to the ongoing investigation. We set out to keep three people. We've got those in custody. They'll now be interviewed back at the police station and the inquiry goes on.